Python, all I need to know is what that thing is. I didn't ask for size, I didn't ask for circumference, I need to know what it is right now. Searching. Well, search faster. I have searched over 300 billion files in the UNSC database. There is nothing like this anywhere else in the galaxy, sir. There is, however, one Oni file that could be useful from the colony Onyx. But it's marked above even your clearance, sir. I want the ship on full combat alert. Log those coordinates, Python. Send out a priority one signal back to Oni. They need eyes on this immediately. Keep us steady at 200,000 clicks. Captain Melbourne, we received a Priority One message requesting Oni staff and a full deployment of forces. What in God's name is that? We encountered the mega structure at just over 1600 hours on April 22nd, Earth Standard Time. We have scanned it thousands of times, but we keep coming up with the same results. Nothing. It's like it's not even there. Whatever it is, it's old, and it doesn't want to be found. The gravitational readings indicate that it has been here for roughly a hundred millennia. Fascinating. We'll take it from here, Captain. Return to Oni headquarters on Reach and report directly to Commander Parangoski. She'll instruct you in your following steps. Understood. Python, take us home. Aye, aye, sir. Welcome to What If Humanity Found Halo Before the Covenant. This is the second what if proposed by a commenter. This time, it was Dakota Lange. I'm trying out something new here, so I hope you guys like it. And there will be a couple of surprises along the way. This will be broken down into five parts. So, let's get started. Staff Sergeant Johnson, take a platoon and ten pelicans down to the surface. Bring your best men. Top priority is to gather info. Over the last few weeks, we managed to do some recon of the structure, but we've learnt everything we are going to from afar. All info we have suggests an extremely similar atmosphere and gravity to Earth. Reports say you're from Earth, is that right, son? Aye, sir. Get it done. Take no unnecessary risk. If you make contact with anything on the ground, I want to know ASAP. Staff Sergeant Avery Johnson takes a platoon of Marines down to the surface of this circular megastructure. Accompanied by a dozen scientists and another dozen Oni officers, all of whom are eager to explore. But this is his mission. They are to gather all possible information before heading back. Their first step is to gather soil samples and atmospheric samples. Investigate if there is any life forms, maybe animals or bacteria. They want samples of everything. In that vein, they decide to land somewhere near a river. After an exhaustive, detailed investigation, cataloging, and evidence slash specimen samples, the group decides they want to know more. Johnson agrees, but is hesitant. This place is creeping him out as it is. It is way too similar to Earth. From an artificial construct, this cannot be a coincidence. What's worse is the itch in the back of his mind. Something built this place, and humanity had rung their bell nearly a month ago, but no one had come to answer the door. This place felt normal, but he knew there was absolutely nothing normal about it. He could feel as if someone somewhere was keeping an eye on him. He just couldn't tell from where. He decides against his own better judgment and allows the platoon to separate into five teams of 15. Johnson thinks of which way to lead his group, and the face of his aunt comes over his mind. The most gentle of his memories seems almost vividly as he remembers her saying, When you don't know what to do, just look up Avery. God is always up there if you need a little wisdom. But when Johnson looks up, all he sees is the other side of the ring. He grunts and heads north. There is no up in this ring, so north is the only up he'll be looking at. The further they go, the more he finds this place creepy. Everything is too Earth-like. The bigger problem he has though, is how they landed on a countryside location. The entire place looked like a farming colony, yet here they were less than 10 kilometers away and he's at a desert with sand creeping into his boots. That doesn't begin to compute within him, considering how he saw a snowy tundra on the way down. But as he begins to have doubts and considers turning back, he sees something in the distance. Something caught his eye, but he doesn't know exactly what until an Oni officer trips and falls. He turns quickly and combat ready, but the Oni officer is pointing directly forward in the direction he had been looking at. The wide-eyed man says, L -l Look! As they all turn their attentions in the direction, he begins to see what his mind had been blocking out before. Movement. Something heads towards them flying. Their first thought is birds, but as the shape gets in focus and comes closer, they see exactly what it is. A robotic structure. All marines have their guns trained on the flying object. It simply floats there in front of them. As the scientists and only officers begin to take pictures and jot down notes, one goes to touch it, only to have his arm stopped by Johnson. Johnson says, Don't touch the robot, it's not a butterfly. The man pulls his hand away and straightens his jacket with a stiff hmph. <laughs> Johnson thinks to himself how old these Oni officers are the same. The Marine suddenly yells out, 
Contact! Lots of them! Johnson turns to look in the direction the voice came from and sees from a distance a hundred silhouettes flying at them, all coming from the direction he had come from. His first instincts are to fight. Their escape had been cut off and none of them had been aware of it. If they didn't move, they would be in the middle of a hundred contacts with no intel and no cover. Johnson orders everyone to follow him. As much as he hates going in the direction where the first one came from, he's more worried about the horde and what they will do. As he's screaming at the marines, Double time marines, move like you mean to. He is also keeping a slower pace to not let the scientists and only officers fall behind. They all struggle to run as they sink in the sand with each step they take. The horde of flying automatons has almost caught up and they are running out of time. But he finally sees in the distance a structure. Johnson thinks to himself this is either their only chance to escape or the Psalm of Robots will catch up to them and he doesn't want to find out what they will do to trespassers. As they get closer to the structure, he begins to feel more unease. The place is filled with blue lights all over. The architecture is almost familiar, almost human, but clearly far, far too advanced for humans. As they head inside, they're trying to funnel the swarm of flying robots into a kill box in case things get ugly. Johnson waits for the machines to head inside and follow them, but they all stop. They're blocking the entrance. Johnson feels shame as he thinks he just led them into a trap. But as they wait for a fight or a strike to commence, nothing happens, so they wait. They don't dare initiate combat as they don't know what the capabilities of these machines are. Johnson begins to grow restless, but he can hear humming, yet they still wait. He tells everyone to be quiet. They'll look at him crazy. He hears the humming again, so he says, Next person to make a sound is going back with a limp. After a few seconds of quiet, he hears the humming again, and just as he's about to get mad, he realizes the hum is coming from further inside the building. He preps himself and raises his gun. He turns on the flashlight and says, Stevens, Smith, with me Marines. As they head in deeper to the humming, he sees a glow of blue light. He feels chills running down his spine, but suddenly he stops in his tracks. He can't believe what he's hearing, the humming. It's the tune to his aunt's favorite church hymn. Johnson picks up the pace to turn a corner when he comes upon the source of the humming. Floating before him is a floating ball with a blue eye on its center, chrome metallic and glowing. The creature approaches him and says, Greetings, I am the monitor of installation 04. I am 343 Guilty Spark. The discovery of the Halo Array brought humanity forward light years ahead in terms of technological advancement, biological research, life expectancy, and their fundamental understanding of the universe was expanded to heights no one thought possible in this millennium. After then Staff Sergeant Avery Johnson established contact with the monitor known as 343 Guilty Spark, it proclaimed humanity as the reclaimers. Reclaimers to what? To the greatest treasure trove in the universe. The technology left behind by a near omnipotent race known as the Forerunners. This discovery was kept secret from the rest of the galaxy at large for over a decade. The only ones who knew about the discovery of Halo were members of Oni and the crew who found it. Unfortunately for the crew of the UNSC Harmony, they perished after the onboard AI malfunctioned and dropped them out of slipspace into the heart of a dying star. Oni notified the families immediately, of course. No one the wiser of how Oni knew the tragedy had happened only an hour after. But that's Oni for you. Upon making contact with a monitor known as Guilty Spark, the Office of Naval Intelligence established nearly 40 bases on the ring world. Project Diamond Ring was initiated. The brightest minds from across the galaxy were sworn into secrecy and separated from all their loved ones for what they believed would be the rest of their lives. In order to be let on the ring for study, humanity began to reverse engineer the technology found on the Halo. The very first and endeavor toward progress was to decode the Forerunner language. With the help of 343 Guilty Spark of course. God, we almost wish we hadn't even found the ring to begin with. After decoding their language, we were able to learn that which the Monitor could not tell us. The Forerunners, guardians of all living things in the galaxy, committed galactic genocide. At first, we were appalled of course. Some scientists refused to continue working on the installation, but we were missing a huge part of the picture. Confronted with the knowledge we now had, 343 Guilty Spark Spark was finally able to fill in the gaps. This race of beings, who had power beyond our wildest imagination, succumbed to a parasitic plague, one they called a flood. These creatures were able to spread out and conquer over 300 million planets right from under the Forerunner's hands. Trillions of lives, an unstoppable army that threatened everything beyond the galaxy and into the rest of the universe. When the Monitor showed us the data, documents, pictures, video, and even a sample he had under extreme containment. 
we no longer had to worry about our scientists wanting to leave the halo. Half of them were found dead the following day, self-inflicted wounds. Others had lost their minds slowly over the course of minutes, days, weeks, and months, but most of them cracked in the end. Oni set up a dead zone on Sector 7, the area housing the remaining flood specimens. Some of us just wanted to destroy them, be rid of the parasite for good, but the monitor seemed to imply there was more flood in other installations. Upon hearing of other installations, Oni began the largest project in human history. The idea was to find all other Forerunner worlds and installations left behind, a task we understood would take hundreds of years, but letting out a single flood spore could destroy the entire galaxy as we knew it. What's more is that we we weren't alone in the universe anymore. We knew there was other sentient life out there. As the monitor stated, there was millions of species that were cataloged to repopulate the galaxy after the firing of the halos. This became Oni and the UNSC's next concern, but with the task of finding other forerunner technology, humanity spread itself too thin. The discovery of Halo had now become somewhat public knowledge. Insurrectionists discovered the existence of Halo because of this, and with the UNSC's technology advancing at an alarming rate, they figured out this had to be the origin point. For a decade, they had been getting outmatched by technology they didn't even expect existed. The invention of energy shields. No longer could they take on a single UNSC frigate without heavy casualties. Advanced technology within our weaponry. They could run and hide, but it wouldn't do them any good. The nightmare of insurrectionists was being wiped out from the inner colonies all the way to the furthest ones. But they refused to lose. They refused to allow humanity into an age of peace and prosperity. Through their network of spies, they had discovered the exact location of Halo. They came to take Halo. Every known major faction of the insurrectionists came together. They shared information and resources. They launched a major assault on installations. 04. The Sentinels and Monitor did nothing, as they saw them as Reclaimers too. They had no idea what would come next. When they landed on the ring and saw how fortified Sector 7 was, they wrongfully thought that was the heart of Oni and the Forerunner secrets. I suppose they weren't truly wrong about that, but it was more than what they bargained for. They broke containment. Those fools thought Oni had created the Flood as a weapon to wipe out the insurrection. They planned to let it loose on the inner colonies and assumed Oni had a cure. They would distribute it amongst themselves and would be the inheritors of all humanity created. They were so wrong. On July 21st of 2515, the nightmare that was dormant for a hundred thousand years was awoken once again. The Flood was released and quickly overcame the insurrection. Over 600 militia groups with nearly 150,000 soldiers landed on the ring. In a matter of hours, the flood had accomplished what the UNSC and ONI could not for hundreds of years. The insurrection was almost entirely wiped out. There are still tiny pockets out there in the outer colonies, but they are insignificant at this point. The UNSC and ONI sent out the largest fleet ever assembled by humanity in order to safeguard the ring, but they arrived too late. The forces they already had present had managed to stall the flood on Sector 7 by sacrificing all their lives. They bought the UNSC enough time to prevent the flood from spreading. Some wanted to outright destroy the ring from a safe distance, but Oni ultimately refused. The advancements being made were too monumental to stop now, and without finding a way to unlock the other shield worlds, they sought containment instead. The flood was safely contained in Sector 7 of the ring. Oni devised a plan to get rid of the flood. A small team of enhanced soldiers would go in and take care of the flood. They chose a small team as to provide less biomass for the creatures. The enhanced soldiers were of the Orion Project. With advancements in bioengineering, and since the discovery of the Forerunner technology, some candidates managed to survive without adverse side effects from the project. This, however, was not enough. They had gone in with specialized gear, advanced far beyond what any UNSC personnel had used before, and after a week, only one operative came back. After being kept in quarantine with nearly eight platoons on rotation for a single man, three months of isolation taught us that he was not infected. Some at Oni don't want to admit this, they just wanted to put a bullet through his head and be done with it. We listened to the man. He explained in detail what it was like down there, what the flood did to his companions, how the bodies of every single one of them was repurposed food for the flood. There was a time when everyone at Oni thought of Admiral Margaret Parangoski as the most dangerous and fearless human in the galaxy. But on that day, we saw what we thought was impossible. We saw fear in her eyes. The following day was the busiest and most expensive in Oni history. Several projects were approved without a second thought. Projects codenamed Spartan, Mjolnir, Infinity, 
Aster, and Cortana. The Spartan program was an inhumane one, but a necessary one. 150 children were kidnapped and replaced with Flash clones, and they were taken to Installation 04 to be trained by the most proficient killers and the smartest minds in the galaxy. These children would be trained by the one man who survived the flood, Sergeant Avery Johnson. Although extremely reluctant to train child soldiers, the horrors of the flood were something he was not keen on seeing and released on the galaxy. It was a mission he took under duress, where after seeing the flood up close, his whole life had turned into duress. All well, that takes us to today, graduation day, August 31st, 2524. This timeline is quite a bit different. Under direct training of Avery Johnson, the Spartans came to see him as a tough but fair father figure, all eager to impress him, especially John Sierra 117. This time around, Johnson made sure there was no casualties. He was not gonna let any kids die on his watch. So far, there had been zero washouts. With Halsey receiving all major funding she needed and wanted, the Spartan program trained 150 candidates. Mjolnir armor was created and tested long ago with advancements on technology and the help of Sergeant Johnson for testing. These are Gen 2, don't let the name fool you though, but they are far more advanced than even the latest Spartan armors in the original timeline. These suits are designed with the flood in mind, meaning Spartans will be provided sustenance from a liquid compartment inside their suits to avoid exposure to flood spores. All basic human wastes are taken care of by the suit, advanced shield technology, and they all have neural interface for an onboard AI. They will go through Project Aster the biological and chemical enhancements of the Spartan program. However, there have been a lot of advancements in both fields. The results? 122 candidates successfully pass graduation, with 13 deaths and another 15 washouts from radical disabilities. Dr. Catherine Halsey immediately begins to work on rehabilitation. AI Deja determines the recovery at just over 65%. Halsey disagrees. She claims she will not stop working until 100% of them make a full recovery. The Spartans now face two months of rehab, even for the graduates. For the rest of the year, they begin to experiment with using the Mjolnir armor. Spartans are deployed on war games on board the nearly finished UNSC vessel designation Infinity. Through years of training, Sierra 117 had proved himself to be a natural born leader, and therefore he is chosen to be the leader of the Spartans and promoted to Master Chief Petty Officer. On December 21st, 2524, Spartans once again go through operations for Neuralink implants. Project Cortana is revealed to them. The intention is for them all to have a smart AI. However, this AI is unlike any before. With help from the advancements in AI development, Dr. Halsey cloned her brain and used it for the basis of Cortana. She has been split into 122 different fragments and will be housed within each Spartan. As the leader, Master Chief will have the leading fragment of Cortana. The Spartans will have a sort of hive mind from their AI and tactical information at all times. They already worked with extreme cohesion. Now it's as if one mind shared 122 capable bodies. Extremely capable bodies. After 10 days of rest and light training, they received their first mission. Operation Hammerdown. Main objective? exterminate the flood. All 122 Spartans will be deployed into Sector 7. They will be humanity's best hope to destroy the flood. If successful, they will be redeployed anytime humanity discovers a new forerunner facility. There will be first boots on the ground and they will go about exterminating every trace of the flood left in the galaxy. The Spartans are given two weeks to prepare for their mission, which they will use on training, planning, and scheming. Master Chief is to ensure no one Spartan knows the entire plan in case of infection. The Orion soldiers Avery Johnson led had turned their own plans against them. On January 15, 2525, the Spartan Strike Group is deployed. After weeks of being separated, the remaining Spartans had finally regrouped. John was happy to see the rest of his brothers and sisters, but also saddened by the remaining numbers. What had started with a group of the most capable soldiers in human history, a battalion of 122 fierce warriors, had dwindled down to almost half. The first two days of their mission, they had been confident in their abilities to take out the infestation. They did not see a single infection form. They had begun to think the flood had spent itself out with no new biomass to consume. They were wrong. They were merely being lured into the clutches of the creature's forces. On the second day, they had their first casualty. A wasted life, in John's opinion. John couldn't even forgive himself for it. Spartan Clancy 142 began experiencing a malfunction with her shields. John hadn't failed to foresee how bad the malfunction was. He believed now the best course of action would have been to return to the entrance and have her new armor inspected, or have her sit this mission out. He was the leader, 
he should have made the decision. Clancy wanted to keep going and he allowed her to. This was his first error. When her shields failed, they were all unprepared. After not seeing any combat, they hadn't expected that the Flood had been watching them the entire time. That was his second mistake. Upon Clancy's shields recycling power, a spike was shot at her from a slob of biomass on a nearby wall. The spike pierced her armor. What followed was a first-hand demonstration of a flood conversion. They had seen it in footage, but seeing it happen to one of their own was a different matter altogether. In the end, she almost took down three other Spartans. Clancy had not been the strongest, that was Sam. She had not been the fastest, that was Kelly. She hadn't been the smartest, that was Luke. But this thing, what she was now, was faster, stronger, and smarter than all of them. Had she not been completely outnumbered and surrounded, she would have bested any of them. The plan had been to wait until they reached to the underground portion of Sector 7 and have a team in each tunnel. They had memorized the layout of the entire ring for years. Guilty Spark had taken them on tours and shown them everything in his database alongside Johnson, but the Flood had spent years down here. They were bound to know the area better than any Spartan ever could. John decided to split them up sooner. Instead of having them all funnel in one location, the Flood had already proven to be too smart for them. Now was not the time to test its wits. Keeping it in the dark of their plans was their best weapon. They separated into teams comprised of 30 Spartans each, John filling in the role of Clancy now. He had kept himself as a reserve for any such situation. Subconsciously, he must have planned for his failure, which made him feel even worse about it. If he had planned for failure, he must have thought from the beginning something would go wrong. Spartans were taught victory at all costs. Was this one of the costs? He would lead Spartan blue team, Fred would lead red team, Linda would lead black team, and Kelly would lead gray team. Master Chief had no direct way to know what the other teams were going through, except for Cortana. They had a sort of hive mind that Cortana was at the center of. He knew what the other teams were up to because he planned the missions. But above that, Cortana kept them informed on all surprises each team ran into and how to deal with them. But most importantly to him, he was able to keep up with the roster in real time. Over the last few weeks, he had seen the status of 43 of his siblings change to KIA or MIA. But he knew the truth. There was no MIA. Not against this enemy. He too had fallen for the false hopes. As team leader, he had logged several of his Spartans as MIA simply because he refused to believe they were gone unless he saw it with his own eyes. Master Chief resigned himself. After seeing the entire roster, he decided to change the status of all MIA Spartans to KIA. This was to be his reminder, his cross to bear. He decided no more Spartans would die. He would gladly take their place at death's door, but he would do anything in his power to refuse to flood any more of his siblings. The mission directive was to destroy all flood by biomass on the ring and secure the safety of the installation. Failure to do so, or an inability to do so, would activate backup contingencies. The Flood had disabled the installation's ability to evacuate entire sections into space, which had been the only reason this measure wasn't taken in the years leading up to Operation Hammer Down. The UNSC had intended to keep the ring intact, as they had no way to speed up the ring's ability to self-repair, but containing the Flood was more important. If the Spartans couldn't do it, no one else could. On the 27th day of their expedition into Flood territory, the Spartans finally had managed to regroup. At which point, their leader, Sierra 117, issued new orders. They would travel to the two locations which the ring needed to activate a detaching emergency evacuation and make their way back to the entrance zone. John assigns Fred and Kurt as leaders of Spartan Silver Team. He would take lead of Green Team. After rotating a few hours of sleep, the two teams would separate and commence the final phase of their mission. As leader of Green Team, Chief constantly keeps checking on the roster of Silver Team. Upon entering the quarantine zone, Master Chief asks Cortana to keep track of how many Flood each one of them killed. Having a more accurate number of the remaining forces could help split the Flood's attention. Cortana estimated the Flood had nearly 200,000 bodies from all the insurrectionists and UNSC personnel that had been unaccounted for during the Battle of Sector 7. They had no way of knowing exactly how many had been dealt with by now, but it was safer to assume all of them were still intact when they entered. Chief thought to himself that Johnson would be proud, but thinking like that was what caused his Spartans' deaths. Underestimating the parasite, according to Cortana, they had killed over 100,000 Flood combatants. She said that statistically speaking, each Spartan casualty had costed the Flood nearly 3,000 combatants, but that did not help Chief feel any less regret. He wouldn't trade any of his Spartans for all the Flood in the universe. The only thing that mattered to him about these numbers was how many Flood were left. If by any chance, they could still proceed with the prime directive of exterminating the parasite, he would gladly put every last bullet to good use. Chief was lost in thought when he heard Kelly in his head. Her Cortana fragment communicated directly to his. Kelly had scouted ahead with Brighton 133 and Stefan 88. They had reported a sighting of an extremely large creature guarding the emergency evacuation system. They had fought pure flood forms by now 
and designated them names. So Kelly's report not having any description besides extremely large was worrisome to the chief. After informing the rest of his team and warning them, he begins to question how large really is extremely large. Before entering the room, the evacuation controls are housed in. The Spartans steady themselves check their ammo, and prepare grenades. But in the middle of all that, they all hear a booming, deafening noise inside their head. I can see you, children. There is no need to hide. I know you. I know your secrets. I share a tomb with your brothers. We are one. The Spartans are extremely disturbed by the intrusion. This was nothing like when they had Cortana implanted in their head. Chief tells them to ignore the creature and push through the pain. They have a mission and it needs to be finished. Not just for humanity, but for each Spartan that was taken from them by this thing. I am not a thing. I am you, brother. I am your flesh. Your blood. Chief can't hear himself think with this thing in his head, so he decides to do what he was trained for instead. He opens the doors and rushes into the room. His Spartans follow in after him. Everyone is stunned for a moment as they see the size of the creature. The monitor had educated them on the existence of a grave mind and the existence of an even more deadly flood form, a key mind. Chief was not sure which this was or if it made any difference. All he could see was flesh and death. The Grave Mind tries to speak into their minds as they begin shooting at it. Everything in this room is attached to it. There is no tank forms, there is no range forms, no combat forms. It's all one piece, with many arms sprouting like a tree branch in an infinitum web of poisoned lice and death. Although the suits were made specifically to fight the flood, Chief thinks he can smell the scent of decay. The Spartans do not let up, cutting it, shooting it, burning it, anything they can think of to harm the monster, but it's not enough. Not fast enough anyway. As they begin to fall, Spartan after Spartan tossed around like ragdolls. Nothing more than playthings for the Flood Supermind. Chief considers self-destruction of his suit. If initiated and allowed to overload, the explosion would be like 30 grenades compacted into a singular spot. Cortana had activated her self-destruction on the other Spartan's heads. But this one, this would be a tangible explosion. One that could severely harm if not completely take out this creature. As Chief decides that he will sacrifice himself, the Grave Mind speaks to him again. This is one thing you cannot atone for. This will become your tomb, not by choice. Cortana stops his suit's power cells from overloading. As Chief yells at her that she is compromising the mission and demands that she let him do it, she says, Look! and pulls up the Spartan roster on his heads up display. He doesn't understand what's going on. Slots he had marked as KIA have turned active. Before he can speak and ask what's going on, three sniper shots are heard coming from the balcony on the opposite side of the room. I hope you don't mind us crashing the party, he hears. John thinks to himself, that voice, that's Linda. Black team survivors reported her MIA. In fact, every team had reported several MIA Spartans, but there were a dozen Spartans behind Linda. Brothers and sisters, they all thought dead. You know better than to count us out, John. He hears Samuel 34 say over his radio. He also hears, we didn't get any invites. I hope you don't mind, in an all too recognizable accent. George stands behind Linda while blasting the creature from a full machine gun. Although the fight is no cakewalk, 13 Spartan reinforcements come in very handy. The Grave Mind is defeated. As they burn the last of its flesh, they can hear an echo in their minds. Savor this moment, for next we meet, I promise, will be the last. They begin to clear out the room as they leave Kelly to be the last one out. She will override the safety countermeasures and allow the ring to evacuate the flood into space alongside the entire sector. Kelly being the fastest means she has a better chance of making it back in time. With the advancements in the chemicals from their augmentations, Kelly's top speed is just over 80 miles per hour now. The Spartans regroup at the entrance of Sector 7, where Silver Team is already waiting for them. They can see that Silver Team also suffered a few casualties, but after making it out of the sector before it gets evacuated and launched into space, they do a final headcount. Their mission took 28 days and 45 Spartan lives. 77 survivors. When they reach the quarantine point, they are examined by UNSC personnel and thoroughly scanned over and over by Guilty Spark and the Sentinels. They go through an extreme cleansing before exiting the quarantine zone and their armors are forfeited 
for destruction in case of any contamination. While in quarantine, Dr. Halsey, Sergeant Johnson, and Chief Petty Officer Mendes approached them. Halsey walks up to John to congratulate him on his mission, but no one feels like congratulations are in order. After so many Spartan casualties, Johnson has made it a point to visit every single one of them. Rumors among the Spartans even spread out about them seeing Mendes shed a few tears when he heard the results. They are approached by Halsey with a new file. Chief gets a small glimpse at the top page, and he fixates on one word amongst the jumble of words on the page. Covenant. Something has happened. March 22nd, 2544. Seven Infinity class vessels drop out of slip space on planet Earth. On board, there is a combination of Spartan 2s and 3s, totaling nearly 300. 61 Spartan 2s and 212 Spartan 3s. As the Spartans disembark, their transport pelicans for debrief on Operation Red Flag, something catches Master Chief's eye. A forerunner structure, unlike anything he's seen before, on Earth of all places. He makes a mental note to ask Johnson what this structure in the middle of Voy is. All Spartans report to Oni headquarters, with one VIP amongst them. Spartan B312 pushes along an anti-grav chair holding the High Priest of the Covenant, Prophet of Regret. As he escorts the Prophet to Admiral Parangoski's office, she looks up from her desk. Before her are two Spartans standing waiting for her acknowledgement. She looks at the leaders and says, Master Chief, you promised me three Prophets. There was complications, ma'am. You call one out of three complications? The Prophet of Mercy refused to come, ma'am, and the Prophet of Truth was not there. I see. So I take it they have only one Prophet left. Spartan B-312 nods. Perengoski waves her hand, indicating for them to leave. The Spartans take the Prophet to interrogation. After three days, the Spartans have been helping with repairs to the ship's damage during the fight against High Charity. During Operation Red Flag, the UNSC deployed every last Infinity-class ship they had. Out of 25, only 7 made it back. Operation Red Flag had been to travel to High Charity and capture the three Hierarchs of the Covenant Empire, while also leaving behind a Nova Bomb on board their capital ship. Master Chief had been there when the bomb was planted, but not when it detonated. Only one person had been there, so the UNSC had not received any reports of the bomb's success or failure yet. But John knew his brother would get the job done no matter what. George had stayed behind after the bomb's circuitry was damaged. It had to be manually detonated. Chief had volunteered to be the one left behind, but his Spartans had not let him. It took five Spartans to restrain him and knock him unconscious, but they took him away to let George proceed. Chief woke up seconds before the Infinity jumped into slip space. As he looked out the window, he saw over a thousand Covenant ships still around High Charity. John felt nothing for the millions that would die in the explosion, except for one. Admiral Perengoski approaches Master Chief. I have a new mission for you, Master Chief. You may take whomever you choose, but mind you, we have very little preliminary intel on the situation. We can only afford to give you a small team for this operation until we can validate the truth of the matter. From the intel we gathered thanks to the Prophet of Mercy, we now know why there has been less elites in active combat. It seems they had a falling out with the rest of the Covenant. Their entire religion was based on a lie, and it seems like the elites found out and were not happy about it. Realizing humanity would win the war without the elites, the Prophets initiated steps to reclaim one of the Halos. The Prophet of Mercy indicates they found another Halo and were planning to gather the entire Covenant and take Meridian. The Prophet of Truth must have betrayed them. Mercy believes he was a no-show because he was gathering as many ships under his banner to cut the other two out of power. They planned on abducting every last human possible on Meridian and forced them to access Forerunner technologies to activate the ring and any other Forerunner technology in their possession. We lost contact with Meridian this morning, which means we are on borrowed time. Meridian is a strong colony, but against nearly 2,000 Covenant ships, they won't stand a chance. Master Chief, your mission is to head to Installation 04. You will convince or coerce the Monitor to come with you to the new Halo. We are going to need his help to decommission the ring. In the meantime, we are gathering 95% of all UNSC forces left to make our way to the new Halo. You will rendezvous with us there. We will also be sending a second team that will escort Admiral Hood to Sanghelios. The Admiral will offer the Sanghelia truce and in turn an alliance to stop and end the Covenant once and for all. And if they say no, Humanity is prepared to crack their planet in half to make sure they never threaten us again. This will be the end of the war, Master Chief. Win or lose, make sure we win. Consider it done. 
We pick up several days later, with Master Chief landing on Spartan Academy Alpha. This was the training site he grew up in. Everything looked the same but different at the same time. Johnson approaches him. John, I didn't know you'd be stopping by. To what do I owe the pleasure? 3 for 3 is teaching children about the forerunners in the distance, but he notices Master Chief and immediately comes up to him. Reclaimer! I have missed your presence. Will you be staying this time? Johnson shoves the monitor away. Don't waste the Chief's time, Tinkerbell. You know that ain't happening, huh? Sir. Chief pauses for a moment, feeling strange calling Johnson sir again. For the first few years of the war, he and Johnson fought side by side. Johnson had become something of a father figure to him during the Spartan training, but their bond transcended that in the battlefield. But this was no time to dwell on memories or emotions. Sir, I have come for Guilty Spark. Guilty Spark simply replies, Pardon me, Reclaimer, but I cannot leave my installation. It is against protocol. You have taught three generations of Spartans. Do you not trust us to protect your home? Our home? 3 for 3 looks back at the children, then at their teachers. The Spartan 2 and Spartan 3 washouts. He looks down, then at Johnson. After a moment of hesitation, he says, Where are we going, Reclaimer? We skip once more, this time to the middle of a battle on Installation 5. Well, around and on Installation 5, as the UNSC and Elite Alliance is having an all-out war against the Covenant. Ships are trading blow for blow, while on the ring, there are over 200 Spartans and the combined might of the UNSC Marine Corps and the Sources on Helios. They are fighting over a billion Covenant troops. The Battle of Installation 5 is the greatest naval battle since the days of the Forerunner Flood War. This is by far the greatest battle in the Human Covenant War as well. Master Chief's direct mission was to stop the Prophet of Truth from activating the ring and executing him. But by the time Blue Team reached the control room, it was too late. The Prophet had already activated the ring and the Flood had been released from containment. The Prophet is succumbing to his infection by the time Chief gets inside the control room. The entire control room is full of Flood. Every second the Flood spreads wider throughout the installation. But they don't make a move to stop the Spartans. They do however taunt them. The Flood knows the Spartans have to deactivate the ring. That's the only reason it hasn't moved in to stop them. But they all know the moment the ring is deactivated, they will have Flood rain down upon them. The 7 Spartan team here is the most capable unit in the unit. SC, but even they don't think they'll make it out alive. 343 Guilty Spark is escorted through the control room by Sierra 117, Kelly 087, Linda 058, Fred 104, Tom A293, Spartan B312, and Sergeant Johnson. Before instructing the Master Chief on how to deactivate the firing sequence, Guilty Spark pre-activates a return protocol for the installation. Once the ring's firing sequence is deactivated, it immediately opens a slip space portal and begins to head in into a journey back to the Ark. The moment the Master Chief deactivates the ring, the Flood immediately starts attacking them. The Gravemind screams with the voice of a million dead warriors. What have you done, puppet of my adversary? I have activated the return home function. All the Halo installations will be returning to the Ark. All of them. All of them. You will not survive the journey. This tomb will be your home. As the Flood forces in the control room begin to attack the three generations of Spartans, the Monitor activates an energy shield that encompasses all of them, which they use as cover to get out of the control room. The energy shield is failing and decaying fast, but the Spartans manage to make it out of the control room. The Monitor is running out of power extremely fast though, and its anti-gravity field stops working before long. As he falls from the sky, Johnson catches him in his arms and asks him, Why Tinkerbell? Why did you do that? 343's eye glows with less intensity and begins to sputter out. He manages one last sentence before his eye shuts down. You are the children of my creators. You are my friends. The monitor powers down. Chief, while shooting flood forms all around them, says, Cortana, mark a rally point for all UNSC and Sangheili forces. Cortana asks where, but Chief says just anywhere. If nowhere on the ring is safe, the best they can do is have a rally point. The journey from Earth to the Ark originally takes 22 and a half days, but on board the Slipspace Highway, specifically for the Halos, the journey is faster. While in Slipspace and on board the Halo, there are no Covenant and there is no UNSC. There is only the Gravemind and its prey. Every ship in orbit of Installation 5 was left behind. Only those that landed came along for the ride. But the worst part was that one and a half billion lifeforms on the ring. On day one, there was just over 2,000 flood infections. On day two, there's nearly 80,000. By the fourth day, 
They had over 30 million bodies at their disposal. Every day on the ring was an exponentially decaying situation. On day 11, the Covenant ceased to exist entirely. All former lines were erased. Humans, elites, boots, jackals, grunts, hunters, drones, they all shared shelter. Deep on the ground inside the ring or on the ships left on the ring. On day 14, 343 Guilty Spark wakes up. This is not the same 343 that saved their lives. This was a brand new being. Something must have gone wrong with him, they figured. His first words were once again greetings i am the monitor of installation 04 i am 343 guilty spark johnson was by his side when the monitor swirled back to life his first reaction was i know that light bulb but what tore out a piece of johnson's heart was guilty sparks following reaction ah oh, reclaimer please forgive me but where am i this is one of my creator's installations but this is not my installation on day 16, what was left of the living forces was substantially surprised when the ring exited slipspace and they arrived on a massive forerunner construct. They guessed this had to be the Ark based on 343's reaction. Their first plan was to activate the rings, either through the Ark or by taking control of at least one of the rings. The sky was full of halos now. All seven had been recalled to the Ark, but they soon found out it was impossible. The moment they exited slipspace, the Gravemind made a move on every ring. The only one that had not been overtaken was the human one. Installation 4. They had decades to prepare against the Flood, but it did not matter. They could not escape, and they couldn't push the Flood back. Admiral Hood, now the de facto leader of the Alliance alongside Supreme Arbiter Thalv Adam, Brute Chieftain Tartarus, Churhat, make a plan. They will use all the ships they have left to try and break the line. Their goal is to get word to Installation 4 and activate the ring. The Spartans would take a vessel and storm the Ark in order to activate a portal to Earth, to which the survivors would escape to and protect from whatever Flood forces followed and made it through. Johnson had informed them that Oni had uncovered a portal on Void, but had refused to send anyone through in case of bringing back Flood. All they had known was that it was linked to the Ark and it was outside the galaxy. They had assumed there was Flood in the Ark, just as there had been Flood specimens in nearly all installations and shield worlds they had found over the years. All of this is a false plan though. The real plan lies within only two people, the Master Chief and Fred. Fred's ship had brought the elites into the Human Elite Alliance with the help of Admiral Hood. When Blue Team arrived on Delta Halo with Admiral Hood and the Sinhili forces, the ship Blue Team was traveling on was a UNSC Pillar of Autumn. The ship had contained a Nova Bomb on board in case the elites refused to join forces. Blue Team would pilot this as a decoy to lure in the Flood forces, while the survivors traveled to Installation 4. On Installation 4, they would activate a slip space jump back to its original coordinates to save themselves. They were confident the survivors alongside the the human forces on the ring could eradicate the flood that made it through following them. While the flood are distracted on trying to stop the Pillar of Autumn and its forces, the survivors make it to Installation 4. There is no Gravemind here. With over a billion bodies of sentient life forms at its disposal, the Gravemind had evolved into something the galaxy had not seen in a very long time. A key mind. It had begun to corrupt even technological minds. The other installations monitors were making preparations to jump back to their own previous locations, which would allow the flood to spread to every corner of the galaxy in a matter of days. With Blue Team seeing that the survivors are close enough to Installation 4, Chief and Fred reveal the plan to the rest of Blue Team. As Chief starts the countdown for the timer on the Nova Bomb, the Key Mind realizes what his plan was all along. It cannot believe it had been outsmarted. It had the brain power of a billion minds, but a single Spartan hatched a plan he didn't see coming. He misanticipated the Spartans' willingness to sacrifice their lives for the races they had been at war with for so long. After activating the bomb, every ship detects a giant power spike on board the Pillar of Autumn. Admiral Hood, seeing this is not the activation to the portal, but instead a Nova Bomb, asks, Master Chief, you mind telling me what you're doing on that ship? Sir, finishing this fight. With that in mind, Installation 4's shields drop, but only for 60 seconds, giving the survivors time to take shelter within its forces. Anyone who does not cross in time would be left behind. Plenty of flood make it in, but a combination of the races of the Milky Way will allow them to stop the spread. The Key Mind speaks to them all. I will not perish here. You follow in the footsteps of my adversaries of eons past. The Flood managed to shoot down the Pillar of Autumn. They had not gained control of any ships, so instead they used the corrupted defenses on the Ark. They continue the fight on board the Autumn, and Chief ends up having to watch each and every one of his teammates die and be turned into abominations in front of him. He thinks of the promise the Gravemind made to him two decades prior, and the Nova Bomb warhead detonates.
all major races in the galaxy form a treaty and a union, with the intent to protect the galaxy from itself and outside invaders, should the Flood ever return. The sacrifice humanity made to allow them to escape ushered in a peace through the galaxy even the most war-hungry races respect. Some, such as the Kig Yar, do not wait long to restart their pirating ways. Some, like the Jirohani, want a bigger piece of the pie. They want humans to share the technology of the Forerunners. All matters are scheduled to be discussed over a grueling committee on Installation 4. But on June 1st, 2544, no one's in the mood for a fight. As the UNSC erects a monument to all the fallen on the installation. A giant statue of the Master Chief, a towering Goliath at the center. On his left and right are members of Blue Team, forming the shape of a shield. Behind them, one of each race currently known in the galaxy. And just behind them, there's a gap just big enough for expansion.